people. And now we have Chris Ash. Thank you. Good morning. Hopefully you can all hear me and everything is going well. Good. I'm sure you've heard more than one person say that the principles that we teach in unity have seeped into every era or area of modern life. They're in the physical and mental health professions, corporate training, sport training, some fundamentalist churches, workshops, self-help books. Our stuff is everywhere. People are learning how to create their world with their thoughts and how to use gratitude to create prosperity. And they read the secret and listen to the teachings of people like Wayne Dyer and many others. And all of that is unity principle. When we remember who we are, we change our thoughts and habit patterns to align with our divinity. We tap into the universe of infinite possibility. And that's the reality we face every day. It is the legacy we are leaving for the world, the universe of infinite possibility. To quote Ernest Wilson from the great physician, times of change are times of fearfulness and times of opportunity. Which they are meant to be for you depends on your attitude toward them. And guess what? Things are always changing. Right at this moment, I would say they are changing much more than normal. Some are happy about it. Others definitely not happy. Doesn't really matter because change is going to happen anyway. It's happening in your life. It's been happening here in your church. The tension here is between who you are and who you could be between how it is and how it might be. And the big question that arises is, will you just sit back and let it happen to you or will you take part and guide the change? And today I dare you to jump in and move with the change. This morning I wanna introduce you to someone who did just that. The older he got, the better he was at it. His name was Walt Jones. And this is a true story. It's a, a metaphor for all of us. Change is here. Oops. Stop the change. Can't stop the change. Wow, I made it better. Here's Walt, and see if you recognize that theme in this story. The story is by one of my favorite authors, Bob Moad. It's a true story. Bob was a reporter, philosopher, and storyteller for a Seattle newspaper. He passed in 2007. And Bob starts his story with a quote from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell said, the big question is, are you going to be able to say a hearty yes to your life adventure? The big question isn't whether or not you're going to have a life. You're going to have a life. You don't have much choice about that. The big question is, are you going to be able to say a big, hearty yes to the adventure that is offered to you? End of quote. The following is all a direct quote from Bob Moad. Quote, no one epitomizes the fact that success is a journey and not a destination more than the many green and growing human becomings who do not allow age to be a deterrent to accomplishment. Florence Brooks joined the Peace Corps when she was 64 years old. Gladys Cleffeson was living in a dormitory at the University of Iowa, working on her PhD at the age of 82. Then there was Ed Stitt, who at the age of 87 was working on a community college degree in New Jersey. Ed said it kept him from getting old timers disease kept his brain alive. 
and no one has stirred my imagination over the years more than Walt Jones of Tacoma, Washington. Walt outlived his third wife, to whom he was married for 52 years. When she died, someone said to Walt, it must be sad losing such a longtime friend. And his response was, well, of course it was, but then maybe again it's for the best. Well, why was that? Well, I don't, I don't want to be negative or say anything to defame her wonderful character, but she, well, she kind of petered out on me over the last decade, he said. When asked to explain, he went on to add, well, she just never wanted to do nothing. She just kind of became a stick in the mud. Why, 10 years ago, when I was 94, I told my wife, we ain't seen nothing but the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And she asked me what was on my mind. And I told her, well, I was thinking about buying a motor home. Maybe we could visit all 48 of the contiguous states. What do you think of that, I asked. She said, well, I think you're out of your mind, Walter. Well, why do you say that, I asked. She said, well, we'll get mugged out there. We'll die. And there won't be no funeral parlor. Now, let me digress a minute. You get an idea. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's get a motor home. Let's travel to all 48 states. And then another thought comes or someone else speaks up and stuff like dying and no funeral parlors and your great idea dies. Let's think that idea killing thought. Let's just hang on to that thought. New possibilities are dangerous. No change allowed. Well, continuing with the quote about Walt. And then she said, well, who's going to drive, Walter? Well, I am, Lammy. She said, well, you'll kill us. I said, I'd, I'd like to make footprints in the sands of time before I check out. But you can't make footprints if you're sitting on your butt. Unless you intend to make butt prints in the sand of time. So now that she's gone, Walt, what do you intend to do? Well, what do I intend to do? I buried the old gal and I bought me a motor home. This is 1976 and I intend to visit all 48 of the states to celebrate our bicentennial. Walt got to 43 of the states that year selling curios and souvenirs. And when asked if he ever picked up a hitchhiker, he once said, he said, well, once in a while, I make a few friends on the way. Walt hadn't had his motor home but a few months and his wife had been buried only six months when he was seen driving down the street with a rather attractive 60 year old woman at his side. Walt, he was asked, who's that woman by your side? Who's your new lady friend? To which he replied, yeah, she is. She's what? She's my lady friend, my lady friend. Well, you've been married three times. You're 104 years old. This woman must be four decades younger than you are. Well, he responded, I quickly discovered that man cannot live by a motor home alone. Well, I understand that, Walt. You probably miss having someone to talk to after having a companion all those years. Without hesitation, Walt replied, talk? Yeah, I, I miss that too. Two? Are you inferring that you have a romantic interest? Well, I just might. <clears throat> Walt, what? There comes a time in a person's life when you knock that stuff off. Sexy replied, why? Well, because that kind of physical exertion could be hazardous to a person's health. Walt considered the question and then he said, well, if she dies, she dies. In 1978 with double digit inflation heating up our country, Walt was a major investor in a condominium development. When asked why he was taking his money out of the secure bank account and putting it into a condo development, he said, well, ain't you heard? These are inflationary times. You got to put your money into real property so it'll appreciate to be around for later years when you might need it. How's that for positive thinking? 1980, he sold off a lot of his property around Pierce County, Washington. And many people thought he was cashing his chips. He's 108 now. 
He assembled his friends and he made it clear, <coughs> excuse me, that he was not cashing in his chips, but he had just sold off the property for some cash flow. I took a small down and a 30 year contract. I got about four grand a month coming in until I'm 138. He celebrated his 110th birthday on the Johnny Carson show. He walked out looking resplendent in his white beard and black hat, looking a little like late Colonel Sanders. Johnny said, well, it's good to have you here, Walt. It's good to be anywhere at 110, Johnny. 110, 110, 110. What's the matter with you, Carson? You losing your hearing? That's what I said. That's what I am. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is you're within three days of being twice as old as I am. Well, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? 110 years of age, a green, growing, human becoming. Walt picked up the opening and quickly alluded to Johnny. So Carson, how old would you be if you didn't know the date you were born? What if, what if there weren't no darn calendar to semi-depress you once a year? Ever hear of people getting depressed at the calendar date? Oh, Lordy, I hit my 30th birthday. I'm so depressed. I'm over the hill. Oh, no, now I hit my 40th birthday. Everyone on my work team dressed in black and sent a hearse to pick me up. Oh, no, I'm 50 years old, half a century. They sent me dead roses and cobwebs. Johnny, who says you're supposed to roll over and die when you're 65? I got friends more prosperous since they were 75 than they were before. And as a result of a little condo investment I made a few years ago, I made more bucks since I was 105 than I did the whole rest of my life. Can I give you a definition of depression, Johnny? Well, sure, go ahead. Missing a birthday, said Walt. May this story of Walt Jones inspire us to remain green and growing all the days of our lives. So that's the end of this, the story of Walt, the man who keeps saying what's next and sees only abundance as a possibility. So what about us? Unity of Verde Valley and churches in general have gone through some major changes in the past year. I'm sure that you've been going through changes as well. It's pretty obvious that even more change is on the way. This past week, Unity Worldwide Ministries announced that we will have a new CEO starting October 1st. He's Reverend Shad Groverland from Unity of Boulder. I feel very good about the leadership he's going to bring to Unity. And what about the changes that are happening in your life? How will you handle them? Change gives you an opportunity to choose between being human becomings or just leaving the sands of time. The Bible is full of stories about times of transition, which I would submit is most of the time. Some of the transitions slight, at other times the change can be quite radical. Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. They were happy to be free, but mad at having to cross the water. They were happy the Egyptians got wiped out by the water, but mad they had that boring white stuff to eat. They were happy with the golden calf, but mad that Moses punished them. They were happy when they saw the promised land, but mad they had to fight for it. Transitions, yuck. Going through transitions is not the exception, but rather it's typical. So we should ask ourselves, what treasure is hidden for me or for us to discover if we give attention to the normal and natural phases that we experience? From the book of Isaiah, the promise, quote, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing, and now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to drink to my chosen people so that they might declare my praise. Is Unity of Verde Valley, or for that matter, are any of us different from our spiritual ancestors? We sometimes symbolically turn our backs on God when things get tough or are moving too slowly, or it's just too hard to wait for whatever it is that we want. Some of us complain and wail and act out when we don't get our way. 
much like the Israelites of old. I find that it's very easy at this point in time to become passive, just kind of throw up my hands and go back to bed. Seem to be doing a lot of napping lately. This resistance, whatever form it takes, can be managed if we approach it with good natured humor. Phrases like we've always or we've never are serious stumbling blocks. They're an easy position to take, but this is not a way of thinking that helps. Granted, resistance can be strong. It's hard to give up deeply held beliefs because they're mostly unconscious. Now when we're facing uncertain times is when we need unity principle the most. It is these guiding principles that can not only get us through the hard times, but can make certain that we thrive doing it. We begin with the fact that there is only one presence and one power in the universe in our lives, God the good, omnipotent. So we begin by turning to this basic truth and know that spirit, which is part of all of us, will see us through. We begin to deal with the sometimes overwhelming change by simply letting go and letting God. We are not alone. And then we remember the second principle tells us that we're naturally good because God's divinity is in each of us. God didn't make no junk. If we're all good, then we can trust that what we're doing and about to do will also be good. It has to be that way because that's the divine principle. And now we apply the third principle and we create our experiences by what we choose to think and feel and believe. We are unity. We don't just sit still and let stuff happen. We create the change we want to see. We know that change is happening, so we put our God powers to work, and we visualize the future we want to see. We are change makers. Our fourth principle tells us to use the affirmative prayer and meditation to bring out the good in our lives. Using the five principles of unity is not a passive practice. We don't just sit back and contemplate our navels, hoping that things will change for the good. No way. We are actively affirming that which we want to see. And when needed, we deny that which we don't want to see. Now, the first four principles get us going in the right direction. But it's the fifth principle that launches us into action. This is the Nike principle. The, it tells us to just do it. Not only do we visualize the change we want to see, but we become the change we want to see. The change happens as we begin to act as if the change has already occurred. None of us may know where the exciting journey we're on will take us, but I think all of us know the general direction we want to travel. So what can you do right now, today, to move yourself, your family, your church a little further in that direction. Think about it. Be like Walt Jones and show that you are all the green and growing human becomings that I know you are. And I know that's exactly what you will do. Namaste. Well, thank you, Chris. You're very welcome. That is awesome. And so it's at this time in our service when we have the opportunity, it's truly an opportunity to practice an important spiritual principle that God is our source, infinite and unlimited and that we are both inlets and outlets of God's good. And so I invite you to take in your hand, in your heart, that which you would share with this ministry and affirm with me the blessing of the offering. Divine love, 
flowing through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God.